Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Melinda Hall. I am recently involved in the Brown Center and excited to introduce to you Dr. Petros Anthopoulos to talk a little bit about new innovations in clustering algorithms that he's been working on. I will act as a discussant for this session, meaning that after Petros's um, uh, presentation. I will get started with some questions and help moderate the chat and any questions that emerge from the audience. So um, I look forward to your presentation, Dr. Zanthopoulos, and uh, please take it away. Thanks a lot. So I uh, just want to make sure, can, can you see my slides? Uh, yes, your yeah. slides are there. Oh, okay, because I, I I cannot see like what what you can see. So thank you. Yeah. So basically, yeah. Uh, th thanks for the introduction. I've been working that problem of um, a consensus clustering, which is basically something that ties with uh, uh, the, the the teaching that I do and the work that I do at Stetson with uh, analytics and machine learning. So this is an ongoing work that um, I ha it's a problem that I have been working like for many years. Um, uh, with my collaborator, and today I tell, tell you about this part of uh, the work. So, um, uh, yeah, so basically, I'm going to give some introduction. I'm going to uh, talk about the maze methodology of consensus clustering and then uh, the, uh, the, the, the developments that we are putting together and for uh, and how they are different from the previous uh, work. So, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Dr. Uh, Ramazan Onlu from uh, Gimus Hane University from Turkey. Uh, Ramazan uh, used to be my PhD student when long time when I was back uh, at UCF. He graduated, uh, he went back to Turkey. He's working there as a professor and we're still uh, working uh, in several like problems that you know we both are interested in. And I would like to acknowledge uh, the Office of the Provost for the support uh, from the summer grant for this project. So I just want to give like a, a, an overview of, um, of the area, first of all. So I'm working on what's called like machine learning. And machine learning is basically the umbrella term that we use in order to describe all the algorithms and the statistics and the technology that we use in order to make a computer perform a specific task without necessarily giving explicit uh, instructions. So basically the, the computer program decides based on some rules or some pre-training, but not with very uh, specific instructions. And it, it relies on patterns and, uh, and, and, uh, and trends that you know identifiable in data. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, like um, uh, topics that we can see. You can find like text mining, natural language processing, robotics, autonomous cars, uh, and a lot of like business applications. And machine learning as a concept is a subset of the artificial intelligence, which is a more general concept that uh, machine learning. So that's just to put like in perspective the um, uh, you know the field. And then uh, some examples of machine learning are, uh, you know, recommender, recommender systems like when you go on Amazon and it knows like your prior, um, uh, your your prior uh, choices, and then recommends new things or Netflix, uh, or automatic voice assistants that we all nowadays are very uh, familiar with, like Siri, Alexa, Alexa, and uh, Google, and machine vision with we see like if you go on Facebook, for example, and it recognizes people's faces and uh, find who they are. So these are all examples of uh, machine uh, learning uh, applications. Uh, now, within the machine learning, I am working with uh, clustering, especially in this problem. And clustering is one group of algorithms that falls under machine learning. And it's a very simple uh, concept to describe is basically grouping of similar objects, right? Whatever that might be. So each object might, might be um, individuals like correspond to humans or uh, items, uh, posts on the internet, documents, like similar objects. So uh, the group uh, that, it, that is, you know, uh, you know, that is, uh, it's formed by putting together like all these objects, they're called clusters. 
And by doing this, by clustering our data and by grouping uh, the different objects into different groups, we can see patterns, we can find some, uh, 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 you know, groups that uh, they demonstrate similar uh, behavior and then that might be very interesting for uh, our application. Uh, just to uh, clarify, generally in my research, I do not necessarily always work with a particular application. So when I say that I'm working with clustering, I, I work with the methods that they are used, the mathematical methods that they are used for uh, doing clustering. So uh, something that I develop, it might be used for a recommender system or it might be used for social media analytics, it might be used for you know, spam filtering. So the applications are basically a later stage that, uh, especially in this presentation, I'm not particularly interested about a specific one. I, I'm interested in general, but not for the purpose of this research. Uh, and clustering is, is uh, since we do this grouping of similar objects, we can use it like for uh, uh, applications such as uh, summarizing the data or finding outliers, uh, recommender systems or uh, in business, we use the problem of customer segmentation that we want to find uh, users that they have uh, similar uh, behavior in terms of processing, analysis of uh, web data. And I will, I'm going to add like a few more applications. Uh, one is like uh, identification of uh, fake news, which is now emerging, for example, you know, if you can find like articles that demonstrate same, similar uh, trends and similar abilities, they might be indicative of you know, they belong to a certain uh, group of, uh, you know, sources and identify them as fake or uh, spam filtering, like the emails that they constitute spam versus no spam. And uh, we have other medical applications like automated image processing. And I'm sorry, I hear the, the, the chat uh, popping, so I don't have the chat in front of me, so I cannot read it, but uh, if there's anything, you know, you can interrupt me and, and ask me. Otherwise, I'll, I'll look at it at the, at the end of, uh, of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, all right, so that's an old example. That's an example of uh, Ronald Fisher that uh, it was back in uh, at the beginning of the 20th century where uh, he clustered uh, the data. And these data were basically uh, different flowers and the flowers were uh, uh, basically described by the petal width and the sepal uh, and the petal length, which is basically anatomic characteristics of the flowers. And based on this, he was able to cluster the flowers into their uh, categories. So this is a very, very early uh, 1920s, 30s application of, of clustering. Uh, and this is something that I did myself. Uh, that's my LinkedIn uh, network. So basically, when I clustered it, and uh, I identify like the items, meaning the individuals that are connected with me through LinkedIn, uh, then I looked at the clusters and I saw like the common characteristics. I was able to find uh, clusters of um, uh, uh, classmates that I had from Greece back when I was like in undergrad there. Uh, stats on faculty and staff that I'm currently working. Uh, you have grad colleagues because I did my PhD there, so I had uh, a bunch of uh, grad students that I knew. Uh, UCF faculty, which was the place that uh, I that was my first job for for five years, and some of the UF undergraduate um, students that I used to have as students in my classes when I was teaching at uh, UF. So. Without me knowing what I'm going to find in my network after I run the clustering, every, every cluster kind of makes sense and uh, it's kind of fascinating what information, uh, you know, somebody can figure out about your life just by looking at your uh, acquaintances network from, uh, uh, you know, from online. And at the same time, it can be scary, of course, right? Because uh, it's more than I thought that it's uh, possible for somebody to, to figure out. And uh, now the motivation for my study is that although clustering is a nice algorithm and uh, useful in many cases, actually the uh, clustering is a problem, right? Uh, the, the algorithms, there are many algorithms there. So what happens is that every algorithm, when we try to different data, it produces uh, 
a lot of the times very different results. So here in these colorful um, uh, pictures, what we can see is that uh, every column corresponds to a different clustering methodology and each uh, row corresponds to a different data set. So the first data set, for example, are the two concentric circles. Whereas over there, it's obvious to see that the two clusters is like the circle inside and the circle outside. Uh, the second line is, the, is called the double banana data set because we have like a few shapes that they look like bananas, that one, you know, it's um, going inside the other. And you can see, for example, that, for example, this spe spectral clustering over here, it does well with the two circles, with the double bananas. And then when we go like, for example, to clusters where we have like these three lines over here, here it messes up a little bit. Other algorithms, they do well maybe with that data set or with, uh, you know, but they don't do well with uh, the concentric circles and the double bananas. So this basically tells us that there is no perfect algorithm that is able to solve a um, effectively every problem and find the clusters in every problem. So what does it mean that some algorithms are good for some data sets and some for and, and some other for some others? And therefore, uh, the motivation for, for my work and uh, for, for, for this area is basically to do something that is called consensus clustering. And consensus clustering means that if we have like every method uh, producing its own result, then we need to be able to put them together in a way that it resembles a lot like uh, voting, like when we vote like for you know elections, right? So uh, each algorithm has its own vote, and at the end, the combined solution makes something that it uh, you know potentially better than the individual solutions. So let's look at this motivating example over here. These are let's say uh, uh, the same data set like four times, uh, but clustered in uh, four different ways, and uh, and basically the idea here is to see how we can combine them. Um, okay, uh, so basically here I just, uh, here is the idea. So we have the data, the different methods, we combine them and then we have like a partition a clustering that uh, it has the good characteristics. Then I have some uh, literature review of different approaches to this problem. And then I want to present the one that we are working with, which is basically the the voting based consensus clustering. So here what we say is that uh, let's take this data point like this, the, the two data points, right? And we look across the data sets and we see if they're in the same cluster or not. And we know that they're in the same cluster if they're connected with the line, for example. So we see that uh, these two data points that are in the same cluster here, 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 and here. So we have four out of four, 100%. So in the consensus graph, we have that this point and this point, they're connected with weight one, which means that's like 100% of the times they, the algorithms agree. Now, uh, let's take two other uh, data points. So for example, let's take uh, this blue one and this blue one. So they're together in this cluster, but they're not together in this, they're not together in this, and they're not together in this. So in these cases, uh, one out of four, which is 0 0.25. So in the consensus graph, they're connected with 0 0.25. Uh, and that's how we can connect, we can basically create uh, the consensus or the, you know, uh, graph that basically it kind of has uh, weights on the edges based on how uh, many times uh, two points are clustered together. And here you can see that a pattern emerges by showing that, you know, one cluster is these three points and another cluster appears to be these four points. So, and the connections in between the data here, they're not uh, so significant. So this is uh, one way to go, right? Now, uh, one criticism to this is that you can see that every algorithm has one vote or in other, way, in other ways, like it has a weight of 0 0.25, one out of four, right? Uh, that uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, fair because uh, what happens is that there is no uh, the assumption that every clustering has to be able to contribute the same amount to the consensus problem uh, is it, not uh, it doesn't have like some necessary uh, uh, justification right so because we might have a very bad algorithm that is bad ac across all the data set and by the time we put it 
uh, you know, in the in the pool of algorithms, it contaminates the results. So we should be able to distinguish the good ones, the good clusterings, and the bad clusterings, and basically uh, make sure that the good clusterings, the voices heard more in the consensus graph, right? And I'm using a lot of analogies that uh, they are not uh, necessarily valid for other applications, but here we're talking about algorithms, so it's basically, uh, you know, uh, we, we want to basically give more power to the algorithms that they do uh, well in general, right? Now there is another problem uh, of uh, when we are dealing with this data is in addition to performance of the algorithm, we also have the variability. Um, a lot of algorithms, what happens if we try it into uh, the same data sets is basically likely to give us very different results. So we can run an algorithm into a known data set, right? And the first time we get like an, an answer, and then we run it again with a little bit perturbed data or with different like initial conditions or some parameters, you know, differ, and the results are totally different. So what happens here is that, yes, if we take the average performance of an algorithm, we might uh, uh, have, for example, here if the first method is you know, been tried three, four, five, six, seven times, the average might be 63%, and here is 55, and here's 56, and here's 62. But the comparison of the averages doesn't tell us the whole truth, right? Uh, we also uh, need to look at the variability, at the variance, and the variance here tells a different story. So if we plot this data, uh, we can see something like this. So you see that the first method, uh, the average is somewhere here in the middle, Whereas the uh, the variability is huge, right? So it's pretty inconsistent what 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 we're gonna see. Whereas other algorithms, they might not have so high average performance, but they are a little bit more predictable because they don't vary across uh, you know different runs. So that tells us that when we are building consensus algorithms, is we should not look only at the average performance of the algorithm in order to dis decide how uh, how it's going to be counted, but also the variance. And this was something that we basically started thinking how we can do it. And uh, one idea that we had is that uh, we have very similar applications in, in finance. So when we're thinking in finance and actually when we're investing uh, money, uh, we do have a lot of options, right? So we have basically the option to buy bonds, we have can buy uh, uh, government bonds that are more uh, reliable. We can buy uh, bonds that are junk bonds, and uh, we can also buy stocks. The stocks also there are like stocks of good companies, of uh, mid cap companies, and then we can do other things. We can buy like cryptocurrencies, all kinds of uh, in investments that we can do. And every uh, investment it has an average return. So on average, like how much money we're gonna get if we put some money into the investments. And also they have a variability. For example, uh, if you buy bonds, you pretty much know what you're gonna be getting at the end of the year. It's like a small percentage that you know the government or the bank gives you and you're pretty much sure that you're gonna do it. Uh, if you buy, for example, a stock of, um, uh, of a relatively small company, you probably know that last year that company had a lot of growth, so the expected return is like high. But uh, since this company is, is small, you don't know what's going to happen this year. So there is like a lot of uncertainty and a lot of variability. So between those two, depending on how risk averse we are, we can make our choices and we can basically build a portfolio by buying a little bit of everything uh, to, to our liking so that we uh, make uh, the risk as much as we can afford to be. And that changes basically based on your age, like when you are 20 years old, you can do more risky investments when you are basically close to retirement. You want something that is more guaranteed and it will not give you trouble uh, you know, later in your life. So uh, this is just an analogy, it's just a concept. And we saw that the analogy of the stocks and bonds, they can also be applied to the clustering data because over here we also have the return, which is the performance of the algorithm. And we have the variability, which is basically how different are the if we run the algorithms over and over again with or with small uh, changes in, in the data. 
So based on that, we thought, why not start using all the mathematical tools that they have been used for optimizing uh, diversified portfolios into the design of algorithms in machine learning, which was basically something that we couldn't find it published or we couldn't find somebody else doing it. And we said, okay, let's try to see if, if, if that's gonna work. Uh, and basically, uh, yeah, again, uh, the idea is uh, we have a, the parallelism between stocks, bonds, ETFs, and, and, and the clustering algorithms. Uh, we want the same way that we want a diversified portfolio when we're talking about money. We also want a diversified algorithm where, uh, you know, when when we do uh, machine learning, and uh, and basically the idea is to uh, to do that. And the, and the first uh, algorithm that came to our mind was the uh, the so-called modern portfolio theory, which is a, 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 a method proposed by. Uh, by Harry Markovich, and uh, he is the one who got the Nobel Prize in economics uh, uh, back in, I'm not sure when, I believe 60s or 70s, uh, when he proposed that idea. And uh, it's a way of uh, balancing the return versus the um, variance with, with optimization. And here, just to tell you the truth, I have like a, a, a description of a block diagram description of the algorithm. I have omitted the, the mathematical details, but I can send you uh, the draft of our paper if, if you're interested. Uh, so here the idea is first to find, uh, uh, you know, we have the data, we run it with different uh, methods, we run it multiple times. Uh, these uh, runs, they yield a certain measure that measures the performance. And we can also find the, uh, the variance across algorithms. And based on that, we can uh, use that Markovich portfolio model, which is an optimization uh, problem. Mathematical optimization is basically, we want the minimum variance subject to a guaranteed return or a, a certain return that it is desired, right? So by doing that, it tells us how much weight, how much importance should we give to every algorithm. Uh, so this is how we generate the weights, and then we use these weights into the second stage of the algorithm, which is basically uh, to adjust the weights of uh, the voting of each uh, algorithm into the consensus uh, partition. So if we are to basically revisit our problem is that uh, we had like these um, four different clusters. And now these three, four weights, they are not 0 0.25, which is equal for every algorithm, but it is adjusted based on what was calculated from the Markovitz uh, 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 optimization uh, method, right? And then that is going to give us, maybe in this case is a toy example, so the, the result might seem uh, similar, but usually uh, we expect to see stronger connections between the clusters that, you know, they're, they're decided to be together and uh, not so much across the two different clusters. Uh, so that, that's the idea there. And basically when we do that, then we need to basically, okay, so that's the comparison of the two schemes. And then we have to make an experimental setup, which means that we need to assume some clustering methods. So here we've got like these five methods uh, here, and then we combine them with some measures that measures how would how good is the performance of the clustering, which is the silhouette index, the kalinsky harabats index, and the davis boldin index. And uh, then we just uh, download the bunch of data and we try to see how, how well we did. Uh, uh, so basically what happens is that we get this data here, uh, which is, uh, and, and, and by the way, this data is nothing like special. It's basically, uh, there are repositories with uh, uh, data that uh, if you have like a new algorithm, you go, you download it from there, you uh, run your algorithm, and then you say, I did in the appendicitis data set, and everybody knows what you're talking about. So these names are basically standard uh, benchmark data sets. We, uh, we, we use the data sets from a uh, University of uh, California Irvine uh, repository. And here are the, car the characteristics, how many samples, how many attributes, and how many cluster seeds data set has. 
And then what we did is that we try to see uh, for every data set, what is the variance with and without the algorithm. And you see that we can, we are able to, uh, we have the two schemes, the red is with the Markovits and the blue is without Markovits. And uh, here is the variance uh, graph and we put it in a radar graph. So basically each data set is around. And when you see like the red being less than the blue is basically our algorithm did well. Uh, if the red is higher than the blue, it means that it didn't work as fine. So you can see that overall the idea works in most data set, but not in all of them. And I can go more into the details, but uh, uh, yeah, but uh, and that's and that's with the first uh, uh, with the silhouette uh, index um, measure. And then with uh, with a different like uh, measure, you can see that uh, the red here does a lot better. So here the variance of the blue is uh, uh, very high. So for all these data sets, we do better. There is one or two data sets here that they are not as good, but overall the majority of the data sets we are able to uh, reduce the variance of, of the um, out of the algorithm on the end. And then this is the uh, the, the third uh, graph. Here the red is in most, for most of the data sets like below the, uh, the blue. So uh, basically uh, another thing that we found out is that uh, uh, if we want a high performance, uh, then we have to allow higher variance and uh, therefore there is a trade-off between performance and variance. And this is something that is very similar to when we're investing, right? So when we're investing, somebody, if, if, you, if somebody wants to get uh, high returns, needs to be uh, accepting like a lot uh, uh, more uh, risk, right? So we found that with algorithms is the same. So if we want to have like more guaranteed solutions or basically more robust that on average they do well, at uh, most of the problems, then we have to sacrifice uh, some of the performance. And uh, the idea there is like how uh, much of uh, the trade of a decision maker is willing to do. So how much we're willing to sacrifice for robustness in other, wise, in other um, words. So, and basically that's, that's overall. And uh, I, I would say I have omitted a lot of the technical details and a lot of uh, the results. And uh, finally, we uh, submitted a paper to the Journal Expert Systems with Applications of Elsevier. And uh, we got uh, our uh, reviews a little bit before Christmas. Actually, I, we had to <laughs> work on the revisions over January and submitted it back in January. So we got minor revisions and basically now we're, we're uh, waiting to hear about the second uh, round of review. And uh, yeah, pretty much that, that concludes the presentation. And, and, the research that we work on. So I, I will be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Petros. That was extremely uh, interesting. We have a few questions in the chat, and then I've noted some of my own questions, some of which are clarificatory and some conceptual. Um, so I'll start with the chat um, to lift up those uh, audience members there. Um, and Harry <coughs> Price would like to know, yes. Um, whether or not you consider yourself an applied mathematician or a computer scientist? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So my first, uh, I think that uh, sometimes they ask you like if you could do something different in your life, would you do that? I would say that I would go back and instead of my degree being electrical engineer, it would have been uh, uh, applied math. Okay. So having done engineering or applied math, uh, and I did my PhD in industrial engineering, and I think I'm not the only one. I think uh, my colleague Madhu is also in that uh, uh, group. We yeah. are the engineers of uh, the business school. Then basically I was seeing that more and more of the things that I'm working, I, they have like application to business. So with uh, the customer segmentation problems and with the big data growing, and basically at some time after I had my first job and I started like working with um, a lot of uh, students and, and research, I realized that, you know, business is actually what uh, uses a lot of what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. uh, that's when I started 
uh, trying to do like the, uh, the, 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 you know, the transformation, but, and that's how I ended up uh, at Stetson, but uh, eventually, yeah, I'm not uh, the one who's gonna, uh, I, I'm not like the business school professor who uh, <laughs> will be interested about a certain uh, problem and then collect data and do regression. I care more about the algorithms and how they work and then I apply them like to the problems, which, uh, yeah, so basically I would consider myself um, uh, an engineer like uh, hidden in a business school, but uh, uh, math was always what fascinated me about this uh, stuff. And I, at the same time though, I understand that the uh, applications and the useful of these things in uh, is tremendous, you know, in uh, in business. So I like uh, the synergies uh, uh, always, and I always uh, try to collaborate with application people and and do uh, joint work. And then I see Stuart has another question. Uh, yes. Well, and I wanted to link yeah. that with one of my questions, if that's okay. So, and sure, the sure. like final portion of your presentation, it struck me as like very abstract as to how mm -hmm. to discover if the algorithm worked, because if you're hoping it shows you something new, right? How do you know if it works? That's sort of like classic problem. And I think that's connected to Stuart's question, um, which I, since you can see it, do you want to go ahead and, and respond to yes. your financial portfolio example? Uh, so don't you want less clustering less to minimize clustering. experience with better diversification? <clears throat> so, uh, do you want me to explain or you got it from the chat? Yeah, yeah, may, maybe if you if you explain a little bit because I, I kind of think I know what you're talking about. Okay, in a Marco, Marco Ed sense, what you want is a minimum variance portfolio to draw the uh, to draw the line, right? So uh, you're essentially wanting um, to uh, maximize return, minimize uh, variance. And so if you're using clustering for that, clustering, if you look at your diagrams, uh, and if it's um, various securities, stocks and bonds, mm -hmm. clustering would mean they're all clustered together. Whereas if you're trying to minimize variance, you want more diversification, uh, which would mean less clustering. Right. Yeah. So, so basically, here is a little bit different the way that uh, we use the clustering. So basically, um, if you cluster a data set, uh, you can uh, have like a a performance of that clustering. So you can uh, have, for example, that you did 80% well, 90% well, right? Uh, now, if you change the data of the clustering, you might have uh, uh, less performance higher performance. So basically there are certain algorithms that very they are very sensitive to what you are uh, basically, uh, what your data is, how, uh, how the, your data change. So then you see uh, the clustering method as a financial instrument. So basically the thing with uh, Markovich is an analogy. So it's clustering methodology is considered to be equivalent of of a bond, for example, that the bond can have certain return and certain uh, variability. So I'm not clustering the stocks of the stock exchange so that they cluster all together, but uh, I evaluate the quality of the clusterings by saying like, okay, we have like good performance or bad performance. And uh, therefore I kind of uh, translate the, 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 the financial instruments into clustering methods. I don't know if that makes sense or. So what you're saying is you're clustering the possible universe of returns on an, an individual investment. And so the clustering helps you narrow in on what that portfolio would be. Yeah, so so I'm clustering data and by clustering data. So let's say you have like a, a, you have like a students of Stetson, right? And I cluster them uh, based on their characteristics and I find different groups that they might be either groups of, uh, you know, how good students are or bad, right? And I do an algorithm and that algorithm gives me a certain grouping. Then I evaluate how well this algorithm did. And that's my return, the equivalent of what I would have a return in, in if I was in the stock exchange. So this is your analogy 
your analogy is helping us see what your methodology is doing, but it does have limits. Yes, right? yes. You I am, are, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not doing. I'm not working like with financial instruments. Uh, I am using the analogy of financial instruments to, but so for example, instead of money that the bond gives you money, the clustering gives you you know 100% accuracy, which is basically the equivalent of money. So. Yeah. So it's an analogy, yes. So I'm using the analogy of the bonds and financial markets uh, to show how this is applied in the design of uh, the machine learning algorithm, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're trying to distinguish those good and bad clustering. So what you're clustering yeah. again is the methodology performance, the original correct, 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 clustering correct. methodologies. Okay, yeah. And so I actually had sort of a question about your um, your analogies themselves because it was interesting to me. It seems like, well, at the same time as you're using analogies as teaching tools for us, the listeners to your your talk, mm -hmm. the analogies also drive the what you build as a methodology, right? Your algorithm. So. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, um, since they're not just teaching tools for you, your analogies are also allowing you to see new strategies in the first place. Exactly. Uh, how do you get your inspiration then for your new analogies? Is it is it just fully creative process? Are you sort of um, exploring analogies with your collaborator, or how do you how do you land on a new analogy to drive a new methodology? So uh, this one was purely by accident. In other work. In other words, uh, when uh, we were doing the first uh, part of our research, uh, uh, Ramazan was putting together the code and he's like, every time I run these algorithms, they give me different results. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, I, I, we cannot publish it because every time I run it, we get like different results. So I'm like, okay, for this first paper, we're gonna fix certain characteristics so that this doesn't vary. But in the future, that's actually a feature, not a bug, because by getting different results every time, you show that some algorithms, they vary more and some they vary less. Therefore, this has to be incorporated in the decision process. And uh, the closest thing I remember from my financial engineering class is like, that's what we do like with uh, bonds and stocks and uh, uh, other, other uh, instruments. And he's like, wow, <laughs> yeah, we need to do that. <laughs> So, so your inspiration really it's comes purely, from the data itself, from stuff that's emerging from your experimentation with data. It is like a uh, devil yeah. is in the details. You think that you think uh, you know how the paper is gonna go, and then something that it doesn't work as well as you did, then you uh, think, oh, that's that that's the next research question, and then uh, you put it and you uh, design your next paper based on that. So yeah, that was uh, totally uh, during the development of the previous work and by observing something that we didn't expect to see and that was actually the fascinating part of this very cool um so i won't keep you on the hot seat for too long but i do have several other questions that i developed yeah, as sure. talking. um so i wanted to know if you could say more about unsupervised learning so um one thing one tension that i was kind of seeing in your presentation that i wanted to understand better is uh, do you not know what the machine will notice across clustering methodologies or are you when you talked about graphing emerging patterns are uh -huh. you are you telling the machine right uh, how to how to notice stuff across the cl clustering methodology so i think this is a question about unsupervised learning right yeah so basically we call it unsupervised learning or clustering in the sense that uh, uh, and we distinguish it with the supervised learning mm -hmm. uh, so when we do supervised learning which we also call it classification we do give the algorithm uh, uh, some uh, uh, correct answers in from previous examples mm. exactly harry, harry says mentioned the training, training sets. Yeah. Sets? So, okay the training set so uh, sometimes you have a uh, training data right so for example uh, if you want to predict the prices of the houses in uh, in Dilan, you have a data set of all the prices how much you know the, the houses has been sold you know over the last uh, year and then if you want to put your house on the market you use that information from the previously sold houses in order to uh, to predict which means that the algorithm knows a lot of correct answers beforehand but now think about um, uh, a, 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 my social media, right? I have a, a, a data set, I have a, 
a LinkedIn graph yeah. where before analyzing it and before putting together the clusters, I don't know what clusters I'm going to find, right? So uh, I found like my friends from Greece, I found my uh, colleagues from uh, UF, and probably if I do it for uh, uh, yours or Stuart's uh, LinkedIn networks, we're going to find totally different clusters. So in this <laughs> case, the algorithm has to find the groups, but we don't know any correct answers beforehand that will help train the algorithm. Right? Mm. So that's that's the this is the distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning. And a lot of the times when we do clustering, we know the correct answers, but we use them only for assessing the uh, the quality of of the result. We don't use it um, uh, in order to train. So basically, uh, we. We, we hide the correct answers and we only reveal it at the end the same way that we uh, do with uh, you know the correct answers of an exam that we use it only for evaluation and we don't give the answers to the student when he or she is writing the exam. You know. And that gives you a sense, so going back to my sort of initial question in, in connection with Stuart's question, that allows you to see how well your algorithm is working. You're withholding the answers yes. so that you Yes, exactly, yeah. So, we don't use the, 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 the quality of the algorithm in order to train it. We use some other uh, measures that are called in internal measures and they don't use make use of the correct answer at the end. Mm. But at the end, we open up the answer and we see how well we did for evaluation purposes only. Yeah. And that's the fitness point that Harry is asking in the chat there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, since it's unsupervised uh, for, for Harry's question, uh, we do not have um, uh, we do not have like a, a, a fitness. Usually, the algorithms converts to a solution, and then we stop them, and we hope that this uh, result is going to be good. But uh, we don't have a fitness similar to when we do regression that we compare with the correct answer and we see how close we are. Because in clustering, we do not use the correct answers for training purposes. That, and that's the difference with, uh, with the supervised learning. So regression, for example, is supervised learning. Uh, Got it. Um, so I heard you loud and clear about the applications not being your interest. So I had a couple questions about that, but I'll leave that go. Um, but my final question for you um, was about misconceptions. It strikes me, you know, even as a philosopher in a field very, you know, it's connected, mm -hmm. of course, to your field, but uh, in a, in a in a conceptual way, but uh, people have a lot of misconceptions, right, about artificial intelligence. So, you know, as I asked you what unsupervised learning is and kind of tried to get a sense, um, could you say, like, what you wish people understood more about your work? What are the misconceptions people often have about machine learning or artificial intelligence? So what is that nugget that you wish people understood more about machine learning? Yeah, so a lot of the times what we say machine learning and uh, it's not something that was invented like uh, yesterday and is going to <laughs> eat us alive, but it's the natural, uh, um, it, it's the natural uh, 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 extension of, uh, uh, of work in statistics and in computer science that has been for years. And when I start talking about machine learning, I start talking about uh, methods that we are teaching in classes, like uh, um, uh, linear um, uh, regression or uh, some people, or classification. So you see, I see like I know Harry, for example, is from uh, from chemistry, so he's familiar with a lot of these data analysis techniques. So uh, when you say machine learning is more or less like the um, the umbrella term of combining the existing maths with uh, the current computer capabilities and applying them in databases of the whole Facebook, the whole Amazon, and kind of see what's happening over there. But essentially, it's not something that people with traditional science background cannot understand. It's basically something that is more of the natural extension of the statistics and the computer science and and the uh, optimization that we learn and uh, it all goes down to very uh, simple principles that we're using now how we use it and how we apply it like for problems this is something that 
it's uh, it's it's up to the society basically to decide and where are the limits and how much uh, data and uh, all of these things but otherwise it's not uh, th this machine learning is not like any new technology that came the last five years and uh, has nothing to do with you know how we're working before thank you petros um sure. so i wanted to give an opportunity oh there's rosalie with a question yeah rosalie would you like to ask your question i don't know if you can unmute yourself or i can ask it for you sure hi everyone um Petro, hi, I, I didn't get a chance to jump in until halfway through because i pick up child from school at this time um, okay. But I, <laughs> what I saw at the end um, was really interesting, and I really am sorry that I didn't get a chance to, to do this. Um, no problem. Uh, see, see this um, fully. Um, my question was about how, how students get attracted to this type of research. Um, any kind of algorithm that helps you to map things or to, to allow you to make pro projections and predictions is so interesting and so um, timely, especially as we're thinking through, you know, everything from climate change to um, ways in which people are going to engage with vaccination to the way the pandemic moves, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. So, um, so how, how would you attract or how do you normally attract students to this type of research? So, uh, first of all, uh, like in my classes, the classes that I'm teaching, I, uh, I try to make it relevant and uh, and uh, basically tie to applications that they care about. So, for example, uh, nowadays when I'm teaching like a time series prediction, I always, and I'm teaching like about the uh, moving coverage and some prediction methodologies, I tie to the prediction of uh, and the trends of uh, COVID number of cases every day and to kind of make it, you know, relatable to what they see every day, either from the news or from uh, an application in, in business. So if they are, for example, uh, uh, marketing students, business school students, I tell them, okay, that with these clustering algorithms, we can group the customers into groups and then we can give them like different... Uh, uh, commercials or different content that it will be more uh, relevant to them or uh, so basically always I try to teach these concepts because some of the basic algorithms of, of these uh, I also teach in, in my graduate classes but mm. make it more relatable with with, with the applications that uh, they can uh, they can find uh, now how I was attracting my students to work on research when I was when I had, when I used to have PhD students, uh, that's uh, I don't know. Somehow, some students were fascinated by uh, by the by, by 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 the applications and by the content before they come to me. So I I didn't have to work more on that because I think they were able to see how emerging and how applicable data and machine learning it is in uh, in most disciplines. So I I didn't have to to work too much on that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask before we uh, close out our session? All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Zanthopoulos. It was such a pleasure to hear about your research. Thank you, everybody. It's refreshing to talk about your research, and thank you for all your questions. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye, Petros. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Nice to see you.